I'm Robin Shepherd. Hi, I'm Nicolene Skumanlo. Hi, I'm Johan De Lange, and welcome to our podcast. We are attorneys practicing as such as Skuman Law, which is a law firm based in Cape Town, South Africa. Today, we'll be talking about breach of contract, how it happens and what you can do about it. Now, the easiest way to explain this is to explain what a breach specifically is, when that's easily to be done with an example. So the most common types of breaches that we experience are those of lease agreements. Everybody rents property, and when you rent property, enter into a lease agreement. And usually those things happen by a tenant whose obligation is to pay rent and a landlord whose obligation is to provide the premises for which the tenant pays rent is where the tenant pays his rent late or does not pay his rent at all. That would be a breach of contract because it's a breach of your obligation in a contract. Now, usually what can happen in those circumstances is that your lease agreement will set out the terms that you require in order to, you know, essentially what you need to do in order to remedy that breach. So your landlord would then issue you with a letter of demand or put you on terms and to say, you know, you need to pay your rent on time. If you don't, I'm going to charge you late fees. And then he does charge you late fees because there's a clause or the eventually it could even lead to them terminating the contract and then telling you, you must vacate the premises. And this happens quite often. And, you know, that's just a common example of what exactly a breach would be in terms of a, a normal contract that everybody experiences in their life. Um, but I'll hand over to you, Nicolene, if you have any other examples for what this could look like. Yeah, I think um, for me, I want to take a bit of a different approach and take a step back and say, what is a contract? You know, and without going into the elements um, of contracts that we would be taught as attorneys in law school, but really just going back to the, the foundationary component of a contract, and that is essentially a promise. I promise to do something, you promise to do something in return so that there's an exchange of promises or legal obligations as we formally refer to them. It also gives rise to certain duties or certain rights that you have. So those are all the formal things we reference in relation to what a contract is. And a breach is essentially where we break our promise. And we may feel that there was a legitimate reason for us to break our promise. But in in simple terms, that's really where the wheels start falling off, is the minute we decide, I'm actually not going to do what I promised to do. And, and of course, it is a little bit more complex than that if we start looking at different relationships. I love this one um, story that I actually stumbled upon um, some months ago about taking a... Um, it's actually for, for creatives or, or people in the more creative industry to illustrate how contracts are actually made and broken on a daily basis in the human experience. And they take a very popular TV series, um, uh, the, black, the, uh, the New Orange is Black, um, and, and they take that as, a, as an example of all these interactions, of course, in a jailhouse setup. Um, and... Proving to, to the audience that a contract is actually a chat that you're having and say, oh, I need this. Oh, I can help you with that. And, and this is how our deal is going to work. So these are typical layman's terms of, of where contracts actually stem from. And of course, that video that I'm referring to is very much tongue in cheek. But the point is, um, sometimes these promises are made, whether they are lawful or maybe a bit more questionable. And the minute it's unlawful, as we know in this room, it becomes an unenforceable promise, right? But the point is, in our normal circumstance, on the day-to-day, -day, in our reality, we are making promises um, and exchanging rights and duties every single day. Whether it is in the grocery store where we buy something at a display price, whether we actually put a contract together, or whether we lease a property, um, and it becomes more serious as, as we evolve and get older or maybe transact in different ways. But the point is, it's a, a, a breach is essentially where we break a promise. So 
if we um, re- keep that in the back of our minds, I think then it becomes much less complex than it is often perceived to be. I think from my side, um, I've definitely seen an increase in the construction industry with contracts that aren't fulfilled on either side. So either, you know, you enter into the contract and for, mo- for the most part, it's um, it can be written or it's um, a verbal contract, but either the um, builder has not performed in terms of his duties by building the house that's really required or um, the specific nitty gritties of that agreement or the builder hasn't received payment and then the the construction project really just stands at a halt. And this, what I've experienced um, has been, has, firstly, it's on the increase, it's on the rise. And secondly, it really turns into a long litigious battle because someone in this contract has not performed what they were obligated to do in terms of the contract. And it just really turns out to be a nasty battle. And ultimately, you know, someone who's trying to build their dream home, it's just they're they really left with a bitter taste. Um, so that's something that I've come across quite um quite a few cases recently with regards to breach of contract. So, so Robin, on that point, you know, what would you then say are the fundamental elements that define this this legal concept of of breach of contract? So naturally, when you enter into a contract, you're entering into a contract with good faith, right? You you're entering into it. You both agree to terms and conditions, rights and obligations, and it really happens when one of the parties either through an act or an omission has failed to deliver on that and that's when there's a breach of that contract and it is unfortunate and it does happen and we really need to be mindful of what those obligations are that we enter into with someone when we enter into a contract and on that point, Nicolene, I wanted to know from you if you could explain to our audience what are the different types of breaches of contract and what are the legal implications of that? I think it depends on the circumstances of each case, of each relationship, of each promise that was made or differently put, the contract that was entered into. But essentially, there are two types of breaches one let's call it the less serious breach right something hasn't happened on time perhaps right that doesn't have the effect of the entire agreement coming to a standstill or differently put it doesn't go to the very core of what was agreed when it goes to the very core of what was agreed and literally the wheels falls off and everything comes apart, that's a material breach. And in general terms, material breaches are usually those where we have to make some tough decisions and exit from the agreement. In other words, cancel the agreement. The minute an agreement gets cancelled from a legal point of view, we then start talking about things like putting putting the parties back into the positions where they would have been had this never happened. Uh, we talk about damages. We talk about extra expenses. You know, it becomes far-reaching in its consequences, and it depends on the type of agreement that was breached and what actually happened. So it's a factual question. But over as an overarching response, I think we have to deal with the smaller things that go wrong that cause inconvenience and maybe some irritation versus the things that go wrong or simply put do not happen or do not happen in the correct way, which actually makes the whole transaction fall apart. And this can be really difficult to distinguish. And that's really where it it becomes very useful, A, to have your contracts drawn up professionally and B, when something goes wrong, to actually reach out to us or to a firm of choice 
and to have a discussion about it. So I touched on this, but maybe, Johan, I can hand over to you. When a breach occurs, of course, something has to happen. There are remedies um, typically at our disposal. What avenues, step by step perhaps, would you suggest to the audience as, as the next step? Look, it ultimately, as you said, depends on the type of agreement you've entered into and what those terms are. Generally, a, a contract that's well drafted would have steps and, and clauses in and how to deal with a breach specifically in that contract. And that usually requires, as an example, it would say, you must notify the party that's breached the agreement that they must rectify their breach within 10 days. Should they fail to do that, then you can obviously cancel the agreement. Now, cancellation, if they haven't remedied their breach, would obviously be the one of the remedies that you can pursue. Now, when you cancel an agreement, there's two things that you can really do. And as you mentioned, there's you can cancel the agreement and then be placed in a position you would have been either have the agreement been fulfilled, which is then you're looking at maybe specific performance, which would be that you're essentially forcing that other party to perform the agreement as they had promised to do or you're looking at claiming damages. What are the damages that you were caused? What, what, how much is it going to cost to put you in the position you would have been? And that's what you're looking at at remedies. But these days as well, you know, most contracts also include alternative dispute resolution methods. So then it would have a clause in there that says, should there be a dispute in, in regards to this agreement, then you can go to mediation or so forth and just in in a way to to save costs and then that decision would obviously be binding on both parties so there's a few remedies that you can do i mean most of the time you know when there's a breach of an agreement just placing the other party in notice can resolve that but in those certain circumstances where it doesn't and they still don't comply then you are looking at taking you know further action and placing yourself in a in a position you that is favorable to you. And that's the point. I mean, a contract is supposed to be fulfilled. But um, I think, you know, on that point, um, I'm just going to ask you, Robin, you know, prevention is sometimes the best med medicine in these types of situations. You know, how do you prevent a breach? Um, what proactive measures can individuals and businesses take to minimize their risk of there being a breach of contract? So I think it would definitely be to draft clear and concise contracts. And that would be to make sure you're putting the terms and conditions very clear, no ambiguity. And that would include, you know, the payment clause or the dispute resolution clause that you mentioned earlier, um, deadlines. And it's really important to outline the rights and obligations of each specific party. But Along with that, to be collaborative, the party should work together to iron out any issues and then to make sure that every now and then the contract gets re reviewed to make sure it's keeping up with the different, you know, legislations. Legislation gets updated regularly depending on what kind of contract it is. To, so to make sure that it is reviewed on a you know, six month period to just make sure that everything is in compliance legally as well. So that if a breach is to occur, either party has the correct um, legislation to really fall back on. So those are the ways I would say that prevention is definitely the best medicine in this instance. And Nicolene, I wanted to ask in terms of the right. nature of the breach of contract, um, how does this really influence the course of action that one could take? Yeah, um, I think, and, and I, I agree with what you've said on the regular review. For some contracts, it, it six months is maybe slightly too long. It really depends on the industry and the nature of the agreement. Um, or maybe others dictate an annual review. But the point is review is necessary we cannot continue to build relationships based on outdated terms or practices and expect anything else than, well, disputes arising. And disputes are expensive. Let's, let's be very, very frank about it. Disputes are expensive. And I know the audience may think, yeah, from a legal, from a legal fees point of view. Yes, 
That's true. But over and above that, the time you spend, the time you spend thinking about it when you are not engaging with your legal team and where it completely consumes you to the extent where you are almost unable to function normally, that has a cost to it because it's an opportunity lost. It's time lost that we can never recoup. So really avoiding disputes as far as possible is really the way of the future, the way I see it. In a fast-paced world where things move quickly, we have to think and be more mindful about how we construct our relationships. Who we are making or forging relationships with. You know, have we asked the correct questions to gauge whether this person can actually do what they've promised you or have you just lapped it up, right? Have you asked them, so where is your, where's your company? How big are you? Um, can you refer me to other people that you've done this for before so I can just do a bit of a reference check? And, you know, those questions we tend to think are confined for job interviews, but we don't ask the right questions, I think, when we are looking at forging a relationship from a contractual point of view. So asking some critical questions, I think, is a, is a good way of prevention um, secondly, and to get to the point of um, the breaches, the least serious ones versus the more serious ones, I think really distinguishing that in your contract to say, if something doesn't quite go as planned and there's a plausible, reasonable reason for it, this is how we are going to navigate out of that situation. Maybe looking at that alternative dispute resolution or going back to the drawing board and discussing it and doing an addendum um, or, or whatever mechanism can really just deal with it when there's so many things to deal with at that point in time. That is really just a compass. If things go really badly, right, and it goes to the core of the agreement, generally we want out with the least amount of damage, right? Both of us. And then I think as professionals and as people engaging in agreements, we need to think about robust ways in which that will happen. And therefore, I think building a mechanism dealing with the less serious stuff and a mechanism dealing with the more serious aspects and really just thinking, is 15 days sufficient? Is this the kind of thing that we can fix with a notice? Or, or are we just... Doing things on autopilot without really thinking why we do them in the first place. So I think it goes back to plain language. It goes to asking the right questions. It goes to um, making sure that we can actually do what we promised to do. And then to build ways or paths out of the messes that can either occur because of things in life that happens and it's not that serious or the bigger things. So that brings us to the end of our podcast today. And we really hope that you enjoyed spending your time with us. If you have anything to add to our conversation, please like, share, comment in the box below. If there's anything that you feel you would like us to talk about, please pop that in the box below. And other than that, in our next episode, we are going to be talking about the good the bad and perhaps the ugly when it comes to tenants, evictions, spoliations, all these technical mm -hmm. terms, and we really hope to see you there. So from us, happy to have joined us today and have a good day further.